This afternoon, Michael and myself will co-present and co-facilitate the process of teaching portfolios. So at the very beginning of this presentation and afternoon here with facilitation, this afternoon we'd like to be much more practically based. We'd like, when the session is over, almost two hours from now, we would like you to leave with a working philosophy statement. What is important for us to understand about teaching portfolios is they serve a very important role, not only in terms of foreign institutions in the United States and England, but at the last glance, over 260 international universities make portfolios a mandatory part of your teaching or job at a higher institution. The other important aspects we'll focus on are the basic definitions, but the most important function for us here today is to align <coughs> our thoughts and ideas for a teaching portfolio in terms of the UWC document on a teaching portfolio. And that document you all have already access to and received a hard copy on the very first meeting that we had two weeks ago. Just be, before we get started, can you, can you just maybe share with us very briefly what your understanding of uh, a teaching philosophy or a teaching portfolio might be? Not all together now. <laughs> Anyone? I think, that, yeah. No, I think you can think of your teaching also by your teaching style and, I don't know, what you do with the students, how you try to you know, interact with the class, whatever you, however you view the class, time to spend. Right. So it, it's definitely a collection of physical evidence. So what Juliana was saying, it's a collection of things that you would gather that would be evidence of an approach. But it's also a collection of your own reflections, critical self-reflection on your beliefs, your values uh, about teaching and learning. Uh, does anybody else have anything that they want to add? Okay. Okay, the framework with which we'll operate in terms of how we are going to contextualize <coughs> the teaching portfolio for our context. Obviously, we look at what is a teaching portfolio, firstly. And in terms of the Schoenwarte, text that was made available to you it was a text published a while ago in the International Journal for Academic Development. The key factors that we would like to illustrate before we get to that one is over a period of time, that seldom reference that I have there for the four kind of a definition of what is a teaching portfolio, the key tool for the four kinds that you see there from the various writers on teaching portfolios over the last three decades is the word vehicle. And that word vehicle is a good way in which to start defining what <coughs> is a teaching portfolio. It captures the physical components that must be there, whether it's your evaluations, your philosophy statement, the theories that inform your teaching, as well as your reflection and reflection of your teaching practice. So if you look at the four pointers raised there in the definitions by O'Neill, Wright, Selden, and Shaw, and Murray, they are vehicles for documenting teaching with the emphasis on demonstrating excellence. And that goes without saying. When we produce work to articulate what we do, we generally would like to paint ourselves in the most positive of light. So obviously, the excellence of that needs to be furnished with evidence. And the evidence then would be your actual documentation that corroborates what you are stating. The empowering of educators to gain dominion over their professional lives. Because it's your own product, there's large amounts of subjective 
analysis that takes place at the initial stage of compiling a portfolio. And what is important in that aspect for that particular definition of empowering the educator to gain dominion, you have control over this teaching portfolio. It's your teaching portfolio. It captures what you do, and it's not necessarily what someone else thinks of you in terms of your teaching. And teaching in the fullest sense, not only when you present yourself in a classroom scenario, as well as the analysis of your teaching, together with the different kinds of components in your curriculum. When you look at the third one that says providing institutions of higher learning with a means to demonstrate that teaching is an institutional priority, according to Prescom, at UWC now teaching and learning has been given a very senior status, or status, but seniority in terms of trying to level it with research. Focus used to be for a long time on research, and a lot of people's perceptions of teaching <coughs> have been secondary. However, the teaching aspect gives preeminence institutionally, which becomes formalized, and the ways in which one can measure what happens is in the academic or the teacher or the facilitator producing this teaching portfolio. It also serves as a means to standardize assessments, <coughs> but allowing for flexibility in the assessments in an institution, because the university has various faculties, departments, and each one has its own specific needs. Therefore, it allows that autonomy to the academic who's formulating, as well as the institution, so that it can also illustrate and point out the particular aspects of the teaching and learning that is taking place at the institution. Individualizing faculty development, that is very important. A lot of staff and a lot of colleagues that are here the ranks that we have vary. Some associate lecturers or junior lecturers, there's an associate or professors here as well, lecturers. To my understanding, and what I see in the class, there's no senior professors here that are part of the participants, but as presenters, yes. So all of us have a career path. And at UWC, the ad hominem roles. And how does the faculty then ensure that there is a process and a way in which that individualization can also be monitored and applied fairly and equally. And that is part of the development of staff. It's not only about attending workshops. You've attended workshops, but now you get the opportunity to include it in your teaching portfolio as well. That would fall <coughs> under staff development and faculty development. We want to also talk a little bit about the UWC context and say, well, there's a lot of data out there, a lot of literature and, and evidence that talks about um, teaching portfolios in a, in a generic or international context. And we wanted to try and bring it back to UWC and say, how is this relevant for us today? So this is from the preamble to the teaching portfolio guideline document that Mahmoud was referring to earlier. Um, I think you all have hard copies of it, and it's also available on Drive. So it's a means for you to highlight what you've currently achieved, and this is linked to <coughs> promotion and probation. So when you go for your interviews for promotion and probation, your teaching portfolio is one of the ways where you can now say, here is the evidence that I have achieved in these areas. Um, it's a means for you to reflect on your teaching practice. So not only gathering evidence, but then reflecting on the nature of that evidence, and then using it to move forward and drive your own learning process. Um, and you need to be able to demonstrate that you've, within your context, been able to um, create an environment that is conducive to students' learning. Okay, so those are the, the three <coughs> areas where UWC is going to look at your teaching portfolio and make some kind of an assessment about whether or not you are eligible for promotion or probation. From the Institutional Operational Plan, um, goal two, they talk about we need to provide opportunities for an excellent teaching and learning experience. It's contextually responsive to the challenges of globalization and a society transition, and it enhances and which enhances students' capacity as change agents. That's a there's a lot of meaning packed into into that goal, um, and the idea is that the teaching portfolio is going to allow you to demonstrate how you are helping to achieve that. So as a kind of a top level objective, 
Your teaching portfolio is going to demonstrate how you are fitting in with this goal of the IOP. In terms of the actual philosophy statement, and that's we're going to talk, I think, in a little bit more depth about what the philosophy statement is. Um, this is an operational de definition of a teaching philosophy statement that we're going to be using for, for this teaching portfolio. Um, and for me, the word, there's two words that really stand out. It's systematic and critical. Okay? It's a systematic collection of evidence. And the critical component is how are you looking at that evidence? How are you evaluating your own practice against a set of criteria or a set of evidence? So that critical component is really important in terms of developing your portfolio. It's not just a collection of evidence. So as an example, if we think about student evaluation of modules. So we get our students to evaluate modules and they give us feedback. Now if you think about that as uh, the identification of students' learning needs. They tell you what you're doing well and what they think you could be doing better in terms of their own learning needs. <coughs> Excuse me. If you just take the results of that, <coughs> of that student evaluation and stick it into your uh, portfolio, so what? So you've done a course evaluation. What you now need to do is you need to look at that student feedback, identify themes, what are you doing well, what are you not doing well, reflect on that process, pull in some other evidence. The students are telling me that, I, that they're not getting this out of the module. Let me go to the literature and see what that says about how I can improve. Write up that little reflection and say next year I'm going to change my module so that I'm not getting the same feedback from the students. As your portfolio develops, you write up how you change that module. Next year you get a different set of feedback. And if you think about that in terms of data, you're doing data analysis, you're gathering the data, you're analyzing it, and then you're making changes based on the data. That's evidence-based practice. So you get to say in a very real way, this is how I'm improving teaching and learning in the classroom. All right, so that, that systematic and critical reflection, I think, is really important. Just in terms of uh, writing that in a, in a more uh, digestible way, the philosophy statement is the embodiment of the rest of the portfolio. It sets the tone. In the philosophy statement, you lay out almost your, your system of values and beliefs around teaching and learning. It establishes a foundation or a context for the portfolio. So you, you start off by saying this is the context against which or within which you should look at this evidence. So it's really important because if you say that your teaching is about putting the student first, right, it's student-centered, learner-centered, and then all of the evidence that you show is about putting you first, then there's a, dis there's a disconnect there. Okay? So it needs to establish the context within which you teach. So the evidence that you show, that you present, must relate back. It must be, um, uh, what's the word, aligned with your um, philosophy statement. It's an iterative process. So the philosophy statement that you write today may be different to the philosophy statement that you write in two years' time. It should be different, because your beliefs and values about teaching and learning should change over time. It should develop. It should become more nuanced and more reflective. So this is an iterative process, and you always come back to that philosophy statement and say, does this, does this present represent who I am as a teacher? Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the evidence that you provide must be internally consistent with what you're saying in your philosophy statement. So there shouldn't be a disconnect between the evidence and the reflection that you're presenting later in the portfolio and your philosophy statement. Colleagues, this is what Michael was speaking about, but in a much more diagrammatic arrangement. And the kinds of questions one will ask in the process <coughs> of developing one's portfolio. I think at this stage everybody understands that a portfolio isn't a finished product. It's a continuous work in progress. And it's one of the, the, the most effective tools that you can use to assess where you are, what was your objectives and your goals in a given academic year based on your experience of your past 
term two or semester or years that you've been teaching. And a lot of us here in this room, I know I've worked with a lot of colleagues here, it goes back over the decade. Uh, there was a time when this kind of tool, I'm saying it's a tool because it's a tool to improve the way we work, but more importantly, the gathering and reflection stage. A lot of times we struggle with that. <coughs> yes, I know I have all the material. I have a whole pile of documents. How do I bring this together? And the challenge here is for most of us to put it on the technological platform, which should be electronically. And you say, well, I have all these evaluations, they're in hard form currently. And one of the good things we are doing here is we're all working on this Google Docs. And we're going to use that as tools even when we do evaluations in the future. Because that then will assist us to work with it in that format. So when you are at the stage of gathering, you're going to reflect on that process as well. But what kind of questions will inform how you are going to do that? And Goodyear and Elkin have a range of questions that one can use to determine what would be most appropriate for one to include this. And they start off with questions, because colleagues here come from the dental faculty, they come from the science <coughs> faculty, the social sciences, EMS, and the different backgrounds we come from obviously require certain particular type or contextual based questions to inform what we will be using. Therefore, you see under what practical opportunities and constraints do I carry out my role? Some of us come from departments where we have large student numbers in first year. 500, 400, 600. We have problems with resources, staff assistance in terms of tutors, the turnaround and so on. And how are you going to include all of that here as well? Because it must reflect the context you come from. Together with that, what values do I wish to impart to students? Because it's not only about you, it's about us and the students together. How do I measure successful teaching? What outcomes do I expect? And normally those seem to be clear enough when you construct your normal course outline with your aims, objectives, outcomes, your week one, your week two, your week three. But what way are you going to measure on that? How are you going to reflect on The assimilation and expression would then take place practically in your teaching philosophy state. That statement is not a one or two paragraph statement. It's actually your teaching portfolio with different components linked to your overall philosophy of teaching. What do I mean by that? It's simple. Some of us say I use the social constructivist approach in my teaching. Others say I'm informed by critical feminist Marxism in my teaching. Still others will say I've been influenced by Paulo Ferrer and critical pedagogy. So how are you transferring that kind of theory that informed your position in terms of your goals and outcomes? When you look at reflection and analysis, and you see the arrows that we are using or is in the model, is a constant to and fro. Michael alluded, and he was, when he spoke about the iterative process. What else is important for us to understand is the use and application. Once you've gathered the material, you've got it there, you're sitting with it, and you want to evaluate your year or your term, then you go back and you revisit based on your new experiences that you have. So it is important for us to understand that that teaching portfolio is a continuous work in process. In process. Okay, we'd like to ask you to spend some time now to start with the philosophy statement. And we'd like you to spend five minutes on the activity below. If you write a statement now, some of you may not have your e-gadgets or your laptops. You can do it roughly on paper and then import it or transcribe or capture it. There's four questions there. What kind of teacher do you want to be? Very basic. You should start answering that. Think about it. What do you believe about teaching? It doesn't have to be something restricted to what you've heard us inform you about. What do you believe about learning? What is important to you and your relationship with students? So put down the few pointers there. Start constructing it. Because you're going to leave from here with a philosophy statement. I think. And, uh, yes, go sorry, just yeah. sorry to interrupt. I also just wanted to say this is quite informal. This the starting out process. Don't don't think that you need to throw in all the big words about the the learning theories and the teaching frameworks and 
This is just to kind of take a little bit of a, a critical reflection and look at yourself and say, what, what do I value in, in teaching, in learning? What do I believe about these things? How do I think about these things? Um, so don't worry too much about you know, trying to put in all the words that you think should be there. I get to Neil. I'm watching you. Um, does anybody does anybody want to feedback um, some of what you uh, have just been working through over the last few minutes? Anybody want to share? You don't have to say this is what I believe in the depths of my heart. It's not about that. Well, was there anything that you found difficult? Was it difficult to express what you believe about your teaching? Um, and I wonder if it's maybe because... Uh, I remember when I sat down and started doing a teaching portfolio a couple years ago, you know, you sit down and you think, well, I've never actually asked myself what I believe about this. It was always just this thing that I did. I walked into a classroom and I taught. You know, now it's, I've, what, do, I mean, what do I believe? Like, this is... So it's a different way of thinking about your teaching and learning. So, so some of you are kind of people were nodding, saying, "Yeah, I didn't quite know what to do." Um, anybody? Anybody want to? Yeah, I'd like to. I, I, I try as far as possible to, to teach, uh, to instill in students the the idea that. It's not a mugs and jug situation, but they need to be uh, intrinsically driven. It's come from within them. So I try to inspire students to develop that kind of capacity. That this thing is not a, a one way operation, that there is a, so to speak, a circular kind of development, which as the process unfolds, moves to a higher stage of development in your interaction with students, you understand? And try that as far as possible. How successful I've been, it's not the to be but that's, but that's the position that I would normally work on. Right. And I mean, you, you're never going to, you're never going to get there. Yeah, like it's, you, it's a you know, it's, You're always going to be looking and learning and yeah. developing. Anybody else? Yeah. I think for the first question, um, my answer was that um, I want to be an inspirational teacher. <coughs> I believe that a new teacher should inspire students to want to 
B uh, or to, to, to do as one to actually do what you have taught, what you have demonstrated, what you have illustrated, you give them that inspiration that they as one be that lawyer, you know, uh, and a negotiator in work they are innocent. So I think it it is really about inspiring them. And I also think it is about helping them kind of connect with what you are still to teach um, so that they, that they find how relevant it is to their own lives. But sometimes we have got the challenge that um, we, we we teach students about these contracts. They have never seen anyone in their own lives. They, they are here about something which they can understand how does it apply to us there. So the challenge is to help them kind of connect and apply it to their own lives and what they can see and what they can identify. Then on the second question, what I believe about teaching, I believe that teaching should educate for life. <coughs> I think that's how far I went. Okay. Okay. Um, there's something that you... Sorry, just to pick up on that point, you talked about being an inspirational teacher. Now, I think you know, most of us would say, yes, we want to inspire our students, but now, that's quite an abstract concept. Like, how do, you, how do I inspire you? It's very difficult for me to intentionally be inspirational. And then what's even more difficult is, then how do you gather evidence that demonstrates that you are inspirational? So the, the teaching portfolio, the philosophy statement is, Yes, it, you, that's your kind of representation of who you want to be, but remember you always need to bring it back to that evidence. And how is your evidence going to be internally consistent with what you're saying in your philosophy statement? So, I mean, it's fantastic we, to say, yes, I want to be an inspirational teacher. But now the, the point of, of what we're trying to do is to try and say, okay, well, how are you going to create that relationship between the evidence that you're gathering and using that to demonstrate somehow that, yes, you are inspirational? That's not a, you don't have to answer, I'm just, just thinking aloud. What I was going to say, I was going to say, I think uh, how you inspire students, I mean, you know, when, when you teach students, you give them exercises where they have to apply what you have taught. Right. Yeah. So I think for me, it's about problem solving skills, uh, teaching them how to solve problems. So you teach them and you give them an exercise, you inspire them to want to solve problems. Okay. So it's the inspiration to want to, to be problem solvers. Okay. Because that is what we are teaching them. That then you kind of help them to connect with what they have learned. That is where I was coming from. Great. Thanks very much. Yeah, I found when I went through these questions that in my mind, teaching and learning are so connected. Um, so when you say, what kind of teacher do you want to be? I want to be a teacher that's a learner. You know, and learning about the knowledge in my field and being on top of the knowledge on my field. I think so there's something to teach about. <laughs> What's going to keep people interested? I have to be on top of my field. Um, but it's also about learning about teaching. So I think that's the, you know, so that there's the content knowledge, there's the work that I do in my field of practice, that there's my ability to do it and to, I, I'd like to learn about them both and maybe teach about them both. I think that's a, a really good point, is that this really is uh, evidence of your learning about teaching. Um, so it's not, it's not necessarily going to be content or context specific, um, or more context specific, but you may have nothing in your teaching portfolio about the content that you teach. So this is, this is evidence of how you are learning to be better as a teacher. And I think it's 100% right to say that they are related. Um, uh, the guy called Ramsden, he said that teaching is about creating a space where learning can happen. So if, you know, I, I can teach as much as I want, but if you learn nothing, have I done it? Okay, so the, that relationship, I think, is very important. And that relationship is something that needs to be reflected on, it, and that comes out in the portfolio. And it, it changes the way that you think about your connection with the students. So you can do all the teaching in the world, but if they don't learn anything, then have you taught it? I was, I was going to say, how do you start to quantify inspiration? I mean, and, and that's what, it, what teachers are all about. 
uh, some might buy into your the whole idea of being an inspiring person. You understand? But to the whole idea is not to reach out to one or two of your students, or two or three of them, but to reach out to all of them. Mm -hmm. So how do you start saying that I have? I mean, there's a disconnect. If you talk about the portfolio, there's a disconnect between the empirical evidence and this normative thing called inspiration. Well, you, uh, what a lot of people do is they actually get, um, uh, I want to call it a, a reference, but they get their students to to contribute to their portfolios. Your portfolio should include contributions from your students. And so if you've got a, a selection of evidence coming from students saying, you know, coming to your lectures has inspired me to be a better person, to be a better doctor, to be a better lawyer, whatever. You know, there, there's some evidence there. It's difficult to quantify. How do you quantify being an inspiring person? Um, but the way that you think about the kinds of evidence that you gather, I think it can go a long way towards demonstrating some of these more abstract ideas. Continue. Um, this brings a lot of fast up on, but the part of my philosophy is I spoke about how my teaching and learning in my teaching style has changed. As I've understood my students' needs more and what they need to learn within both the contents of my subject and also the contents of where our students are coming from, so has my teaching changed. And I reflect on that in my philosophy because that's where I've grown. Yeah. Um, I came in with, this is how I'm going to teach because that's how I learned as a student. Mm -hmm. And learned that that doesn't cut it. Um, and then all those different ideas and how they came together to now what I'm teaching. And your portfolio should reflect on that growth. Yeah. So in a year's time, it's perfectly appropriate to look back and say, you know, a year ago I thought this. And, and point back to whatever you gathered last year at the same time and said, I can't believe I said this. No, I, I no longer believe this. I, I no longer think in this way. Or I do. This reinforces what I think. And so that kind of back and forth in the portfolio, I think, is, is quite valuable. So it's not about your portfolio. You don't prune and cut away all the things that you don't like anymore. It stays there and you reflect back on that because that's how you show growth. That's how you demonstrate change. If it's only ever a snapshot of where you are at this point in time, then we don't get to see where you've come from. We don't get to see that growth. So it's, it should be time-based as well, your, your portfolio. So you should be able to look back into the past and then to also think about what's coming up in the future. Where do I want to be? What do I need to do in order to get there? I just wanted to um, play the issue of evidence, uh, Michael. I um, I developed a portfolio also a couple of about a year ago, and uh, one doesn't realize the importance of the issue of evidence. And just to link with your point about uh, being an inspiration, if that's a huge priority, uh, if you don't know what the portfolio requires, and I think this process really helps with that, if you don't know that the portfolio requires evidence, you actually don't hold on to the things that provide the evidence. So when I pull the portfolio together and I get with this inspiration, I want to be a guide, I want to um, uh, give something of myself, and then they say, so where's the proof? I then sat back and thought, oh my gosh, I got these emails from students and I finished open course and somebody sent me something cute and I got a thank you card and my notice board but I clean up my office and I don't have it anymore. Um, it's just a, 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 a kind of, I now realize that you actually have to be conscious about holding onto those things. It sounds like such an awful technical, logistical thing, but now when students send me an email that says something nice, I actually printed it, put it in a box somewhere or whenever I need to have to look at this. Um, because you don't realize, you know, you, you read it, and in the moment you sort of feel warm and fuzzy, but you don't realize that this is something you should photocopy, punch, and put in a file, because the rules are always going to think of the problem is going to ask you, so who we'll said this and when did they say it? Um, so it's just a tip for the future, is box things. You won't always make it smart and nice immediately, but find a place where you cut it in and and, and then also just to get away from that kind of technicist approach of just it, this being a mechanical process of just gathering, then that, that's when the work starts. So now you have the evidence, then there's a reflection, an integration, go to the literature, what does the literature say about this? So there's, and there's that planning for the future. So it's not just about gathering a big pile of evidence, that's just the starting point. And from there, that, that's when you kind of choose the direction that your portfolio is going to go. 
Okay. Okay, colleagues, now we're going to move on to getting down to exactly what evidence, how you're going to gather it, and what must it conform to. And at UWC, there's a document that you all have now. It's called Teaching Portfolios at UWC. And you'll see it's broken up into nine categories, or nine subsections, numbered one to nine, and each section has a whole range of questions. I don't think there's anyone who can have every question in all those categories in a teaching portfolio. It's not possible. But elements and sections that would then apply to you <coughs> should be there in each of those categories, should they be important enough to be there if you do have them. And the first one deals with student learning and your students' learning needs. Using the guideline that you do have, you pick up two or three questions from the slide, the next slide that will be there for those of you who don't have access online. And you need to think about what evidence you can use to corroborate those claims that you would like for your students. Because that's a question Mark, uh, uh, Mark raised earlier. Another colleague spoke about it as well, the quantifying and so on. The important part or component of answering that question is you do have other ways in which you can measure to an extent your successes. And some of them are, for example, certificates, course evaluations, peer review. Peer review is an important component that shifts away slightly from students. And a lot of us have our courses evaluated, besides departmental evaluations and so on. You get a colleague in the faculty or outside the faculty or from another institution that evaluates the subject or the module or the program you teach. And that may be very positive. And that is the documentation that you should keep because it's evidence of what you've done from an independent outside specialist. The other important ones are the course evaluations. A lot of us take them, we just dump them in the past and that was where it ended. You know, but it's important that now you analyze it and you also keep it there. The other important question you all would probably be thinking about is, how do I present this portfolio eventually? Oh, mountain of material that says you're an inspirational teacher. Which one do you keep and which one do you do? That's why it's an iterative process and every year or two you should seriously get rid of the dead wood and just keep the best ones. So should you need to print it and submit, it, it cuts a lot of time for you. Okay, these are the questions we'd like you to pick. Not all of them, all those bullet points that are there. Why is an understanding of students' <coughs> learning needs relevant in your context? I think that kind of question is the most basic one we all grapple with every day. One of the colleagues here earlier said that how far we go in achieving those kinds of things, well, that's something that we all need to work on continuously. Have you engaged with the students' learning needs? And what informs that question for you? A lot of you may be thinking of that. How do I know that I have addressed that need or learning need of my student or students when you're dealing with large classrooms and so on? And in, in answering a question like that, you normally would determine in the faculties that we work in through a process of reflection with your students. You generate a list of questions that are relevant to the material you've presented. And the most basic ones are, did you find the course interesting? You know, it's either a yes or a no, it's left blank. Then you move on a little more. Explain what was interesting for the course. Why did you find it? Give an example. And those questions help to narrow down for you. The other important questions are, how did you find this out? How did you find it out? Did you find it out through a reflective process? Was it a questionnaire? Was it just coming from the course evaluations that you used? Or did you gather information with your staff through the tutorial programs that you have? Have you measured out the outcome of each lesson? And in there, scaffolded in these kinds of questions. And through that process, you elicited this information. So those are the kinds of ways you can 
determine or try and gauge or understand your students' learning needs. A lot of these theorists who've written about these teaching portfolios, especially uh, Peter Selden, he's the one referred to a lot in the literature. Even Sean Water, the article you have referred to Selden as well. He was at UWC uh, more than a decade ago when Terry Folbrach from the AD Center was still here. He gave a whole presentation here as well on teaching portfolios. And it's good that two decades didn't go and at least now it's mandatory, you know. But the point is, what do you still need to know? And in all the literature one has surveyed, it's difficult to understand when will you come to the point that you know everything about your students learning things. I don't think that's, that's something that we can focus on. So what do we have? That's what we should focus on. Because now it's an issue of compliance. It's not an issue of abstract philosophical debate. You need to produce a teaching portfolio because that determines whether you promote or not. The other important question one can look at is how do students' backgrounds affect their learning? And you don't really see in our context, I think that's a very important question. A lot of times you hear colleagues and staff complaining and bemoaning and all the negativity about our students. They can't write, they can't string two sentences together. They want to be an attorney, they want to be a doctor, a dentist and so on and so forth. The important thing for us to understand is they come with a culture of learning and a capital that's there with them. Some of them are very techno-savvy, and we're not. So maybe it makes us feel a bit inferior at times, and then we vent it into other things. But the point here I want to emphasize is how do their backgrounds affect their learning? We've had our students come from the most challenged of public schools, and yet they seem to seamlessly go through their four-year programs. Mm -hmm. And others that come from the West of it, they're here for seven years, excluded a few times. So, the other important question for us is, what have you done to facilitate that transition from high school to higher education? And that affects us at the first year level, and some of us at the extended curricular programs a lot. Mm -hmm. And then we get flack from the third year lecturers and the honors and the masters because they say, what are you doing there first year? You understand? Mm -hmm. So a lot of us have interventions that we use in our programs to enhance and improve and build on the qualities and the strengths we find from our learners. And we utilize the resources at UWC, sometimes we use the Writing Center, sometimes we use the CIECT to help them to access material electronically and otherwise. And a lot of us now do not use e-teaching anymore. We use the Canva platform because our learners can access it even on the phones of the university premises, so if they're struggling to access. And that would also be a useful tool for you to use when you want to communicate with your students as well. <coughs> right, and using Google Docs, I think we all know now that they are also on the MyUWC. So it makes it easier to communicate on that platform. Okay, colleagues, before we kind of get into this next activity, I just want to kind of lay out you know, what we're going to be doing with the rest of the session. So remember right at the very beginning, Mahmoud said this is going to be a very practical session. And so we're going to spend the rest of the session working through the different sections of a, te a teaching portfolio using the UWC guideline um, as a framework. So there's going to be a lot of writing, a lot of discussion, <coughs> I hope. Um, but the idea is that you leave today with a very rough outline of a teaching portfolio. And as, the, as this course progresses, you keep coming back to this teaching portfolio. So things that you learn on the course, we want to see that being integrated into your portfolio. Okay, so this is not, this is not an activity for today. Today we're laying the groundwork for what you are going to be building on and using for the rest of the course. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to leave the slide up. You're going to work on that for a few minutes and we'll put up the next slide, will be the next section. If anyone has questions, Please feel free to answer. We're going to roam around and see if we can give input. Can I, can I ask one question before? Of course you can. Um, I know that uh, the pass rate, the good pass rate, is one of the measures of, uh, of a good teacher. And now, assume that you are, you are asked to teach a class where the pass rate is always low because of some reason that are beyond your control. Um, 
how do you deal with a situation like that? How do you align your teaching portfolio in that regard? Well, that's not a complicated question at all. Um, <laughs> because you do everything you can do to improve the bus rate, but it doesn't work. And you don't want to cheat. <laughs> I, man, that's such a loaded question. Um, the, the, point, the point of the teaching portfolio is that you can at least demonstrate that you're making an effort to try and change things, to try and improve things. You know, if your if your pass rate is low, this is, you know, we're dealing with a, a problem of student success in in our faculty, in the CHS faculty, and. You know, student success can be measured by many indicators. We don't just look at throughput or pass rate as, as an indicator of success. But, you know, regardless of what measures you use to, to determine success, whether it's high or low, we can always improve. And the, the teaching portfolio is really just about trying to produce evidence and show that you are trying to improve. So that when somebody comes to you and says, you're a bad teacher, your students are always failing, you can say, no, 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 look, I'm." I'm really working hard at this problem. Um, I guess that's, I don't know if anyone else has a, a different answer or a different way of thinking about that, but for me, your teaching portfolio is really just a, a defense. If you're in that situation, it's one way where you can say, look, I'm, I'm really trying hard. Rather than just saying, you know, I don't know if you've heard that thing, you know, insanity is trying the same thing over and over again and trying, expecting a different result. So this is a way for you to say, well, look, I'm trying different things. I'm trying to be better. And if the result is always the same, I don't know. <laughs> Another important thing you should know for that question, thank to that uh, Michael and colleague, is remember when you're having this continuous battle to get the pass rates up, it's not only in my problem, or you. it becomes a departmental <coughs> problem as well because it's flagged as a course that has a high, I think the term they use is high impact now. Yeah. Sounds like some health fitness thing, high impact, or killer course, or whatever you want to call it, right? The point is, that is not a reflection on you as an academic, unless there are other factors that have already been done, or in terms of intervention and so on. So the question is, you work with your faculty teaching and learning specialists. This is the problem I have. They will sit with you and see what you are doing, probably come to your lectures and your tutorials and assist you with strategies to work around improving the learning that takes place with the student and what you are doing gets effectively communicated. And that then must be captured into your teaching portfolio as well as the strategy and what you have done to address them. <coughs> so that would then ultimately be reflected in your teaching portfolio as well. So you have a grounds of justification say you've done. Okay, so we're just going to spend a few minutes working on this section of the portfolio. This is about your students' learning needs. Please don't start at the top and work your way down. Right, that's, these are just stimuli. These are just ways to get you thinking about the problem of, of your students' learning needs. Okay, so write down a few sentences. Have discussions in your groups. We're going to be floating around. Ask us any questions that you may have. Right, and then right at the very end, we're going to uh, give some feedback and some discussion. Okay, so just, just five minutes, colleagues, just working on, on this particular section of the portfolio.
Guys, Ronald, how about your group? Thank you. Thank, thanks, everyone. Sorry, I had to raise my, I had to use my outside voice. Um, I know that these conversations can be very interesting, and but we, we do need to just keep the keep the wheel rolling. So we're going to move on to the next activity. One of the things that I do notice sometimes is that the conversations can become quite generic, generic discussion about teaching and learning in my department, the problems we have, and these are our experiences. And while those discussions can be fruitful, um, we want to make sure that by the end of this session, you're going to leave with a very rough outline of a teaching portfolio. So the, try, to, try to keep your focus in your groups on the teaching portfolio, on the questions. All right. So this is the, the, next, um, the next activity. It's about your approach to learning. Ask about your teaching philosophy. How does your teaching philosophy relate to the UWC context? Learning theories. That might be a little bit problematic because while you may have heard of learning theories, you may not have really engaged with them in any depth. Um, for ex one of the things that you might write for the learning theories, you know, I've kind of heard about this thing called social constructivism, behaviorism, whatever. I think that that might be interesting. I'd like to look a little bit more into that. So you write that now as a note to yourself. When you go home tonight, go and look up social constructivism. <laughs> you say that you say that like it's supposed to mean something. What is what is this thing, Friday night? Uh, I've heard of this. It's thing called the weekend. Other people have them. Um, if not tonight, if not tonight, if that's too much to ask, tomorrow morning I'm sure we'll be fine. <laughs> Sunday night, any time that suits you. So, if there's something that you see now and it doesn't immediately make sense, you, know, you don't know enough to be able to write about it, just make a little note to yourself. I'm going to follow this up later. All right. And then I think that learning theory is one is particular to, well, that might be problematic. Are you aware of what your colleagues use? Um, you know, how do they think about teaching and learning? There is no right way about thinking about this. Um, I would say that there probably are some wrong ways. Um, flexible learning, there's a lot of discussion in the, institu in the institution at the moment about flexible learning. Um, you know, what is your understanding of that? What do you do in your classroom that will help your students to be flexible in how they approach their learning? Um, how do you promote it in the classroom? Um, do you allow students to submit work in different um, uh, formats? So uh, how do you expect students to represent their knowledge to you? So do you allow them to do it in the form of a narrative, a concept map, uh, interpretive dance, whatever, whatever, is, whatever you think is appropriate for, for your students? Okay, so we're just going to spend a few minutes now on, on, that, on this activity. Is that
about it we never reflected on it and um, so maybe this is a way for you to kind of structure from this a way for you to structure that that reflection process so it's you know the, the idea isn't that we are all complete novices and that we've got no idea what we're doing that you know this is all brand new in many ways we do a lot of these things um, and maybe now this is just a way for you to kind of think about it to structure it in a systematic way and later on to critically self-reflect on on what it is that you do in your departments. Okay, so I want you to talk a little bit about assessment. Okay, your approaches to assessment in the, in the department, how you align your assessment with your outcomes, 
how you deal with feedback. Have you looked at assessment in any different ways? I think that the, the mass, uh, mass allows you, I think maybe 20, 25 different ways of assessing your students. But most of us use tests, assignments. If you're really, really crazy, you might add a portfolio. Okay, so there's probably about 20 plus other ways that you can assess your students. Do you use those other ways? Okay, so that's just another way of, of reflecting on, on how you use the tools that are available. Normal criterion reference assessment. So do you, do you assess students against some set standard or do you assess them against each other? Um, do you look at validity and reliability of your tasks? So how do you know that your task is actually measuring what you say it measures? Moderation. You can do internal moderation. So that would be something that goes into your, um, into your portfolio. So if you do internal moderation of your tasks and you record that process, then that's something that can go into your portfolio. If you don't record it, then it's, it's just a, a story. It's just an anecdote. Okay. All right, so let's spend a few minutes on assessment. The next activity is, I think, one of the easiest ones. It's an administrative function that you fulfill in various committees. Some of you have served on them already at University of the Western Cape. Some of you will start to serve on them. And this particular section in the portfolio document asks you, in what way have you contributed to taking the project of teaching and learning forward, firstly, in your department, in your faculty, institution, regionally, nationally, and internationally. Some of us are only at departmental level. Some of us may be at faculty level. And all of you here by default are in some way or the other addressing that question because you are here to improve in terms of your teaching and learning, right? So departmentally, as well as personally and professionally. You just have to reflect on the work you've done already or you intend doing and how you are going to. That is all this asks of you. So I'll give you a few minutes on that and then we'll proceed to the next one. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to just very briefly go through the rest of the slides. Uh, this will all be made available in Drive. Um, scholarship, I think, is a particularly important section. This is looking at your, your response to the teaching and learning enterprise. So what research are you doing into your own teaching, into your students' learning? And the level of that research into those areas. Are you able to publish, a, uh, publish papers in journals? Are you presenting at conferences? Do you have invitations to present keynote speeches at other institutions? <laughs> These are the kinds of things that we should be moving towards. We are developing expertise in this area. And scholarship is one of the ways where you can demonstrate that you are developing expertise in this area. And this is not expertise in your discipline specific area. This is developing expertise as a teacher. All right? So we are moving towards this idea of, of scholarship, a scholarship of teaching and learning. Um, professionalization of teaching and learning. So what, what evidence can you present that you regard being a teacher as a professional activity? Do you go to workshops, courses? Do you attend formal programs in your department? Do you present formal workshops and programs in your department? Do you plan them? Uh, do you do this at an institutional level, a national level? Um, how are you measuring the outcome to the success of those programs? Technology integration? This. There is a big push at UWC um, and I mean, in the rest of the world um, to integrate technology into teaching and learning practices. This doesn't mean to say that using technology makes you a good teacher, um, but technology can amplify. So if you are a good teacher, te you can use technology to be better. If you are maybe not so good, then sometimes the technology can actually make things worse. <laughs> The idea isn't to say that you must integrate technology. The idea is that this is a tool that can help your teaching practices improve. Evaluation. So how are you evaluating your own teaching practices? What feedback are you getting from your students, from your peers? Are you evaluating your modules? What, goes, what 
do you do well? Uh, what can you improve on? Reflecting on that and then looking forward to say, how am I going to address this issue? So when you get feedback from students that say, that say you know, I don't know, a very simple example, I don't like the fact that we always start late. Okay? This is something that is very easy for you to address. Okay, if we're going to talk about time, we expect students to be on time. So do we are we on time? Right. Do we respect their time and say you have to show up at nine, so I need to be there at nine? These are very simple, that's a very simple example of it. You must respond in some way to your students' evaluation of your teaching. So our original idea is that you would now go back and look at your philosophy statement. So having gone through this exercise of examining different aspects of your teaching, you would then go back to your philosophy statement and continue to refine that statement. Okay? But now you'll just do that tonight, obviously. Or tomorrow morning. <laughs> I feel like I'm at my first year. There is a paper that's been shared in the participant folder on developing a teaching philosophy statement. We would like you to go through that paper, reflect on it. You need to work within your groups, write up a reflection on this, this document, um, give each other feedback, and then use that to continue working on your portfolio. Your portfolio is not going to be complete tonight or tomorrow or even next month. Okay? The idea is that you've got a bit of a structure now, a bit of a framework, and as you move through the course, you'll be able to continue adding to your portfolio. All right. Does anyone have any questions about today's session? You guys are exactly like students. Anything to get you out the door quicker. <laughs> Uh, last thing, last thing, Prof. Bozilek has asked us to remind you that some groups have not been participating in the previous homework sessions. All right. So please make sure that you are keeping up to date with all of the activities that are given. Make sure that you're giving each other feedback. Try and set up face-to-face -face meetings. Some of the groups are having face-to-face -face meetings. All right. So try and set up those meetings to work more effectively on the activities. Thanks everyone. Thank you.